If you want to turn to Jeremiah chapter 1, I'm going to talk a little bit about the foundations. I can't find Jeremiah. I know he's in here. He's hiding. <laughs> Jeremiah. <laughs> I was reading a book by... Um, he has. He's literally gone. Uh, I was reading a book by Wayne Cordera, and he's talking about he was going through a hard time in ministry, <laughs> and he's really ready to give up. And then... Um, a friend, Jerry, sent him a lifeline. And Jerry said this and Jerry said that. And I said, oh, Lord, I want a friend like Jerry, you know, because we've got, I was going through a hard time here with Open Heaven. I want a friend like Jerry, Lord. Give me a friend like Jerry. And I read on a bit longer and it's Jeremiah. <laughs> <laughs> so, Jeremiah chapter 1. I want to talk a little bit about... Goshen, I, I'm not quite happy with that name. I don't know what else to call it at the moment. Redemptive Refuge, something like that. Um, but we have to establish it in our lives and we have to establish it in our community, our, our house of open heaven. And it's recognising that it really is a sacred responsibility. It is a, uh, it will take dedication and humility because we're going to have to unlearn things and learn new things. Um, but it involves the great commandment that we are to love him with all of our heart and soul and mind and strength. And I have found that I don't really love him with all of my soul like I think I do because oftentimes those unrenewed thoughts pop up and take space. And I thought, oh, gosh, my soul, love, I blessed you, soul, to love God more so that there's no room for unrenewed thoughts. Um, so there's that. The, and then the commission, you know, like disciple the nations. And I think sometimes we look at that and think that's way too big, that's way too hard, that would be like for other people, the Benny Hins, the Reinhard Bonkies, like I don't know. But however, if we all take our rightful place in society... If we all do what God has called us to do, we are taking our place in discipling our nation because you will be discipling the people around you. You might not necessarily be taking them through the Bible, but by the way you react to things, by the way you hold yourself, by the way you speak, by the way you love, by the way you express yourself, they're going to sense something. And so even in that, there is a discipling. And, uh, and so there's everybody, if, if we all recognise that where we are, where God has placed us and what God is wanting to do through us is involved in discipling Australia and other nations, I think we would probably look at things a little bit differently and recognise how important you are to the call of God or how important the call of God is on your life. Because sometimes, you know, you look at it and you think, whoa, I don't know how to disciple a nation, Lord. I'm having trouble just discipling people in open heaven. Like, hello. But, um, but we all have our place to play, don't we? We all have our part. And if we all do it, then our nation will be affected. Our nation will be changed. And the other thing I think that's important in our redemptive refuge is that we must represent the kingdom not church. We must represent the kingdom. And in Matthew 24, 14, it says, when the gospel of the kingdom will be preached around the world, then Jesus, will, Yeshua, will return. The gospel of the kingdom, not the gospel of salvation, which I think has gone around the world. You've got to get saved. You've got to go to church. You know, got to be a good Christian, read your Bible and pray. Um, the gospel of salvation, but that's not the gospel of the kingdom. And so we need to recognise that there's a difference between the gospel of the kingdom and the gospel of salvation. The gospel of salvation is kind of like your entry into the kingdom. You get saved, you, um, you, you enter into the kingdom, but we haven't been really good at explaining what the kingdom is, that it's righteousness and peace and joy and the Holy Ghost, that the kingdom is a demonstration of power. Um, we haven't been really good at expressing that. And if you look in the natural, you know, other people from other countries, um, you know, try to get into Australia illegally, 
you know, through the boats, through other ways, um, because they think they're going to get a better lifestyle here. Well, we've presented the gospel of salvation, which is, you know, if you, if you get saved and come to church with me, you can have as much fun in life as I am. Um, but it's not really kingdom, no. right? And so you don't see a lot of people trying to get into the, ch the church, the ecclesia, or whatever it might be, because they don't see that it's a better way of living. But it is a better way of living, but only if you live kingdom. And so it's recognising that in this kingdom, and I'm a great one to talk, but in this kingdom, there is the opportunity to live in divine health. There is a kingdom to flow with divine, there is an opportunity to flow with divine wisdom. We serve a king who has a kingdom and that you are citizens of that kingdom, which means you are entitled to everything in that kingdom because he's given you the keys of the kingdom, not to the kingdom. You've got the keys of the kingdom, which means you can access anything in the kingdom of God you want. You are an heir of God and a joint heir with Jesus Christ. And I love being a joint heir because that means anything that Yeshua has, anything that Yeshua does, anything that Yeshua is, is me, is mine. I can do it because I am a joint heir with him. I'm in him. He's in me. We're all wrapped up in the Father, the Holy Spirit swirling around us. It's just amazing that we've got the fullness of Christ We've got everything that he has. There is nothing outside of our accessibility, nothing outside that we can't access in the kingdom. You've been given the keys. It's open slather in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. Open slather. You can, you can access anything. And I was, uh, you know, I was reminded again of when I was praying with two other people and we found ourselves in the, I don't know what would call it, except like the warehouse of heaven, but where we ended up first... Um, was all the, all, the, all the things you need for healing. You know, everything. There was kidneys. I took kidneys for a, a friend of mine and, and body parts. Okay, so the body parts. Well, I, I first visit, I didn't know what to call it. I was just astounded. And I'd just come back from Uganda where I'd prayed for so many children who'd rolled into the campfires where their mothers are cooking and they sleep by the fire and they roll into the fire. And so, so many of them had scarred skin. And, um, and I just prayed kind of, but I never even thought of asking for new skin, but there's new skin. There's so many things up there that you can access. And uh, one of my friends went off and she was looking for a house to buy. And um, she went into the house section and she saw the house she wanted and she's, she's lived in it, yeah. right? Um, somebody else loaded up the trolley with everything she wanted for her sons. And then she said, oh, I don't know how to pay for it. And then, ah, oh, Jesus has paid for everything, you know, everything. Just walk in, walk out, don't worry. And then I, I turned and I ended up in the place of the emotions. Is there a, room, a name for that? The emotion part? Whatever you need for your emotions, for mental health, it's all there. Like, it was just amazing. It was, you know, I am absolutely in awe of our God. He is so generous. He is just amazing. And then I turned again and it was like I was in a big toy room and there were um, you know like big toy containers and people are on their knees you know when kids are in their toy box and they're looking for a particular toy no 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 and they're throwing them on the floor behind them and then all of a sudden yes that's what I'm after so people were on their knees and they're going through these looking for whatever it was the book they were to write the song they were to, to publish um, the, the business they were to start the patent for something the invention of something but they were just going through it was like and everything was so freely accessible and sometimes I think we don't realise how freely accessible everything is. Everything. God withholds nothing. And I know that the proverb says he holds nothing from those who walk uprightly. But we're in Christ Jesus. We have been made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Jesus has qualified us. We know we're not Old Testament, we're New Testament. And so we have everything that you need all the time. And the, the first sin that Adam and Eve committed before eating of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was that they, well, there was a couple really, 
Um, you know, the devil says, well, if you eat this, you can be as wise as God or whatever. He tried to sell them something less than what they already were. They were made in the image of God. They didn't have to be like him. They were made in his image. So he offered them the second-rate goods, and they took it as better than first-rate. Like, seriously, what were they thinking? But they were influenced. But what happened is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil was in the middle of the garden. And they had to walk past every tree that God said you can freely eat of every tree in the garden except that one. And all they saw was poverty. They didn't see the abundance of God that he had surrounded them with. They didn't see the goodness that he had surrounded them with. They didn't see the, you know, the, the, just the generosity. All they saw was we are lacking. And all they wanted was, you know, this. So lack, the notice of lack was one of the first sins before they actually fell. And how many of us sometimes fall into that temptation to see only lack? Materialism. Yeah, or whatever it might be. Um, but yeah, we, we see the lack instead of saying, well, God's an abundant God. He's generous. He's my, my father. Amen. Yahweh will provide for me. He's, a, he's good. I praise Yah, you know? So um, it's recognizing that, and, and any time we go to make a decision based on what we think or reason out or analyze, we are doing it from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. We must learn to live from the tree of life, from Yeshua himself. So there's a whole lot of stuff that, you know, that we've got to start thinking about. Um, but it's the gospel of the kingdom that's going to make a difference. It's the gospel of the kingdom. And if you want Jesus to return earlier, preach it around the world. Because, you know, if you look at the huge, and I'm not accusing or coming against, but if you look at the massive campaigns that are held in Africa, and all the thousands and thousands and thousands of people that get saved. But that's it. They're not taught kingdom. They're not taught anything about kingdom principles, that they serve a king. They're not taught about anything. They're just saved. Now we need to get you into a good church. And we need to get you discipled. But they're not taught kingdom. And so quite often when the African evangelist or the, the evangelists to Africa go back into a, an area to, you know, have another meeting. A lot of the people that were saved aren't Christian anymore. They've gone back to whatever it was they were in because we've not taught kingdom. It's kingdom. Now, Jesus proclaimed the very first thing. He's the king, the king. And everything was about the kingdom and the kingdom. So everything that we do really has to re, re, Reveal the kingdom, the king and the kingdom. So our redemptive refuge. We have to build our own personally and corporately before we can enlarge it to take in more people, more space, more territory, more land. And so um, if you want to turn to, first of all, keep your finger in Jeremiah, but go to Deuteronomy 24. Sorry, Deuteronomy 4. Verse 27, we'll start in verse 26. This is the Lord speaking. I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day that you shall soon utterly perish from the land which you're going over the Jordan to possess. You will not live long upon it, but be utterly destroyed. And the Lord will scatter you among the people and you will be left few in number among the nations to which the Lord will drive you. And, you know, it goes on to say, there you'll serve gods. So what it was is that there's almost like if people are scattered and um, it's, it's a curse. Like the Jews realised that when they were scattered, they were under a curse. And if we have a look in Jeremiah, we're going to find a people that were actually scattered. And this is the instructions that Jeremiah gave them to build a redemptive refuge in the nation they were sent to as prisoners of war because they were taken captive by the Babylonians and taken into this land. So I just want to talk a little bit about this. Um, and, and honestly, I really believe we're moving into a season where holiness 
is so important. Um, and, and almost like a pruned lifestyle. That what we could get away with maybe last week or last month, we're moving into a place of deeper holiness and not so easy to get away with. If what I'm, if you're getting what I'm saying. Yeah, deep roots, not a bridge. Yeah. <laughs> Jeremiah 2.11 says, Has a nation ever changed his gods, even though they're not gods? But my people have changed their glory, their God, for that which does not profit. And chapter 3, verse 9. And through the infamy and unseemly frivolity of Israel's whoredom, her immorality mattered little to her. She polluted and defiled the land by her idolatry, committing adul adultery with idols of stones and trees. And so at times there are things that we need to be um, realise that it might not be sin as such, but it definitely interferes with our intimacy with the Lord. Because he's a jealous God. Yes. He's jealous. He loves you so much. He does not want to share you with anything, which is wonderful. Um, so we can't afford to allow an inkling of spiritual adultery into our lives. You're really married to one husband. Yeshua. Everyone's quiet. Am I doing okay or do you want me to stop? You were really quiet. It's a little bit unnerving. <laughs> so in Jeremiah 25, 11, and again, I've got the Amplified Classic, but in Jeremiah 25, 11, what was that? <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> <laughs> Bit of joy, that's so good. <laughs> you need to have the white hanky and wave it. Woo! <laughs> so Jeremiah 25 11 says, I don't know what it says, I can't find it. Um, For both false prophet and priest are ungodly and profane. Even in my house I found their wickedness. So there's coming a cleansing. We know that. We know that there's coming a cleansing within the body of Christ. We, we've been talking about it. We know it's there. Um, but it's recognising that, that to build a redemptive refuge, there are certain things that we need to take in, into account. Now, the people had been warned for so many years that if they didn't get their act together, so to speak, that they were going to be scattered, that another king would come in, Nebuchadnezzar would come in, and he would take them captive. And so there were a number of attacks by Nebuchadnezzar. The first invasion um, found Daniel and his friends being taken in, uh, into Babylon. The second, King Jehoiakim and his prophets were taken in. And you can find all of these in 2 Kings chapter 24. Um, but that was the second invasion that got King Jehoiakim um, and, and the prophets taken into captivity and taken to another place. And then Nebuchadnezzar installed Zedekiah as the new king of Judah because he thought he could control him. So he picked Zedekiah to be the king over Judah to control the nation. Um, but Zedekiah rebelled again. That's in 2 Kings 24. And uh, Nebuchadnezzar launched a final campaign against Jerusalem. And that's in 2 Kings 25 verses 1 to 10. And this, this second, um, uh, oh, this final campaign, Jerusalem's palace and the temple were burned to the ground. The city was in ruins. Um, it was just, it was just like over. And, um, and so they were taken, a large majority of them were taken into captivity, into Babylon um, through Nebuchadnezzar. But they had been attacked three times. And I think they had been warned for 18 or 19 years. I forget how long. But they'd been warned for a long time. Listen, you have got to get right with God because you're, not, you're putting other things before him. You're committing spiritual adultery. You know, if this happens, we're going to be scattered. So we need you to come back. But they weren't listening to the prophets. They weren't listening to what was being said, you know. Some people, it's just like they're just deaf. 
spiritually deaf and they just didn't hear they didn't respond and so Nebuchadnezzar comes in and takes the first lot and he took a lot of the youth so Daniel and his friends went and then uh, the second attack came and that's when you know the the king and the priests went and then the, after the, then there's the final one where everything is just raised to the ground and a large majority is taken into in and taken into Nebuchadnezzar's kingdom, and uh, and Jeremiah comes along because he'd been there through some of the attacks, and he comes in Jeremiah and he has a word from God, and it's not the kind of word that you would think God would speak, because if you've been taken captive, just say China invades Australia, and then we get taken captive, and we get taken back to China, or we get taken wherever. This is not the kind of word you would expect. This is not what you would expect to be told. You, you know, you think, oh my gosh, and, and you think you'd be, you know, held prisoner and all that kind of thing. But God's given them a mindset of freedom. And he's saying, if you will live in a certain way, then you can um, have a certain amount of freedom and a certain amount of influence within the nation to which you've been taken. And so Jeremiah comes in with these words of encouragement, with these words of hope, with these words of uh, instruction, if you like. And part of it we find in Jeremiah 29, 11, you know, the plans I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you hope in a future and expected outcome, not plans for evil. Um, but it's hard to see the plans of God for good when you've been taken captive and stuck in another nation. So Jeremiah comes in. And he says in the very first verse, chapter 1, verse 1, the words of Jeremiah, the son of Hilkiah, of the priests who were in Anathoth in the land of Benjamin, two or three miles north of Jerusalem, to whom the word of the Lord came in the days of Josiah, son of Ammon, king of Judah, in the 13th year of the reign. Um, he said, it came also in the days of Jehoiakim, the son of Josiah, king of Judah. And he's, go, he's going on to say, you need to know the priests. You need to know the elders. You need to know the leaders that are around you. You need to know that God has put, even though you've been taken captive and you've been put in a foreign land, there are elders that God has placed around you. There will be priests. There will be prophets. There will be kings. Not kings, you know what I mean, but leaders. So you need to understand that there will be leaders in the group that's been taken captive, leaders in the redemptive refuge, leaders in Goshen so to speak there will be leaders and you need to recognize who they are because the health of the leader will be reflected in the health of the community and so recognize the leadership that God is wanting to build in open heaven recognize the leadership that God is wanting to bring into our, our redemptive refuge recognize the leaders that are around you so you can serve them well honor them not just talking about the house here but talking about work talking about the people you associate with, recognise those in positions of authority over you so you can walk in honour. Because the minute we step into dishonour, we open a door for an attack. So it's learning to, okay, I recognise the leadership, I will walk and honour them. You know, um, when I was, as you know, I'm, in, I'm involved with Robert Henderson with... Um, Oh, I get the names confused. Global Reformation, Apostolic Network, and Global... Yeah, the, the, it's where he combines apostles and prophets. GRA is what it stands for. I'm in that. He's asked me to preach at that. I'll be speaking again at that this year. Um, but it was interesting because uh, three respected ministers that I would assume in the scheme of things, would be higher than me, rang me and asked permission if I would be okay if they joined. Like, why me? Like, why me? And so, um, so it was really interesting, the honour that has sometimes been released. And Australia is not really an honourable nation. We take the mickey out of things. We cut down the tall poppy. You know, we're a little bit sarcastic in our humour. Um, but we don't really understand honour. So first and foremost, Jeremiah is saying, listen, you need to understand the elders. You need to understand the leaders that are around you and we need to be able to walk in honour because it's the, the health of the leadership will reflect in the health of the, um, of the community. Just as a side notice, there was a church in Cal uh, Canada which was a big church and was growing well. 
and the minister fell into sex sin. And so, you know, there's the, the shock, the scandal, kind of the split in the church. But the church board rallied, um, sought for another uh, pastor for the church, prayed about it, sought God, impeccable credentials, employed him, ordained him, commissioned him. He took over the pastoral bit in the church, fell into sex sin. He'd never done it before. Six times, six different pastors, because the church had never repented for allowing it in the first place. The church board had never taken spiritual responsibility. And the minute that they did that, the seventh pastor is okay and the church is doing really well. But what a lesson to learn that sometimes there's things that happen in the realm of the spirit that we do not notice and we don't take, you know, it's like there might be a fall in leadership and things happen. I know we were at one church and again, the minister fell into sex sin and he was given 12 months to re repent, turn, be restored. And my kids were teenagers and they saw him as their spiritual dad and had a great relationship with him. But when he went back to be restored in the church, the uh, pastor over the church then refused to allow him in the church. Even though, you know, you can come back, you can be restored. Well, no, you can't. We've decided not to let you back in. So what happened then was over 20 teenagers walked away from church and never turned back. And my son's one of them. You know, so the things happen that we need to recognise, okay, this is a sin. We need to repent on behalf of open heaven or we need to repent on behalf of our nation because we don't want to allow it to get bigger. We want to actually uproot it before it gets too big. Am I making sense? So honouring the leadership, even if it like, it's not about, um, you know, it's just honouring the leadership. And, and the Bible actually says we are to honour one another. Yes. You know, so that was the first thing. But then he says in verses 5 and 6, before I formed you in the womb, I'm in the wrong chapter, no wonder it's not making sense. I'm thinking this is not making sense. This is why it's not making sense. It's in Jeremiah 29. I cannot wait for church to finish. I haven't had breakfast or lunch and... and I think you can probably tell that I'm not functioning at 100%. <sighs> Danny, early dinner. Early dinner. Jeremiah 29, verse 1. These are the words of the letter. Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to... That's it. Because I'm reading it to you and I'm thinking it doesn't make sense. Where is this going? <sighs> and it was Adelaide's fault. <laughs> I'll, do a, I'll do an Adam. It was, I don't know what time we got home last night. It was about 11 or something, wasn't it? Um, but these are the words of the letter that Jeremiah the prophet sent from Jerusalem to the rest of the elders in exile and to the priests, the prophets, and all the people whom Nebuchadnezzar had carried away captive from Jerusalem to Babylon. And they were going to be there for 70 years, right? And this was after King Jeconiah, also called Keniah and Jehoiakim, and the Queen Mother, the eunuchs, the princes of Judah and Jerusalem, the craftsmen and the smiths had departed from Jerusalem. And the letter was sent by the hand of Elisar, son of Shaphan, and Jemariah, son of Hilkiah, uh, whom Zedekiah, king of Judah, sent to Babylon, to Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon. And it says, Thus says the Lord, um, the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel, to all the captives whom I've caused to be carried into exile from Jerusalem to Babylon. Now notice in those verses that that's where he mentioned the leaders. Mm. Right? So that's where he mentioned the leaders. But then in the next verse, verses 5 and 6, they're actually told to build houses. So you've been taken captive. You have no resources. You have no money. You've been plucked out of your own home, your own nation, and you're taken away and put in another nation. And what does Jeremiah tell you to do? Build houses and plant gardens. Does that make any sense in the natural? But this is a word from a supernatural God. And he's trying to tell them, if you live this way, things will be very different. You will not be treated as prisoners of war. There will come a permanency. You're going to be here for 70 years. This is going to be the best way for you to live. And so in... Um, Jeremiah 5 and 6, he says, Build yourselves houses and live in them. Plant gardens and eat the fruit of them. 
Take wives, have sons and daughters. Take wives for your sons. Give your daughters in marriage that they may bear sons and daughters. Multiply there. Do not be diminished. Right? So well, how incredible is that? Like taken away captive and God says, this isn't a time for you to be diminished. This is a time for you to multiply. So whatever situation you are in where you feel like you're being diminished, where you feel like it's less than what you should be, where either the finances aren't what it is or you feel that you're kind of like trapped in a corner, you can't be who you are. This is not a time to feel allow that sense of diminishment to come upon you. It is a time to rise up in the power of the Holy Ghost and to say, yeah, you know, this is where I'm going to multiply. Because the original mandate in Genesis chapter 1, verse 28, be fruitful and multiply and replenish the earth, still, still abides to this day. And so he says, build houses, plant gardens, you know, like get married, have families, think about your grandchildren, leave a legacy, change your mind set and so this whole letter from Jer um, Jeremiah in these, this chapter to the exiles in, uh, from Jerusalem in Babylon this whole thing is about think differently you might have been taken captive but you don't have to live captive you might have been um, put in a foreign country but you don't have to live like you've got no rights there and so this whole thing is a different mindset. It's not what you would expect to hear. You know, you'd expect to hear, well, never mind. It's only for 70 years. It'll be okay. Just, you know, chin up and what's the English do? What do they say, the English? Stiff up a lip. It'll be okay. It's only 70, it's only 70 years. It, you know, you'll survive. It's nothing like that. He's saying thrive, flourish, multiply, build houses, plant gardens. But what he's saying is I'm giving you a mentality of freedom. You might, feel, you might have been taken captive, but I'm giving you a mentality of permanency. It's only 70 years, but I want you to see the permanency that I have for you. Make yourselves at home. Thrive, you know, um, I, I, and I want you to learn the language. I want you to understand the transportation systems. I want you to understand the laws of the country. I want you to be able to move about freely. I don't want you to feel like you've got to um, be controlled or confined or anything. God's saying, I want you to come into this country and even though you might have to talk like them and live like them, understand who you are, that you are, you are my chosen people and I have called you and there is a supernatural power and anointing upon you to do what I want you to do even in the worst of circumstances. Thunderous excitement. <laughs> <laughs> so what I'm asking is, are you actually thriving where you are? Yeah. Thrive, regardless of your circumstances. Be content and thrive. Expect to multiply regardless of what's going on. You know, and when he says plant gardens, that was an agricultural community. It might be for us to start businesses. Get a job, go to uni, find out whatever it might be, make a living, become self-sufficient. He's actually saying to them, you might have been taken captive, but I want you to take charge of your life. Take charge of your life. Build a family. Make a strong community. Build a network. Relational. You know, it's so important that we kind of get this, that our redemptive refuge, we're going to have leadership. There has to be leadership or there's anarchy. And it's not going to be control. It's going to be Holy Spirit orchestrated, Holy Spirit led and governed. But then, you know, okay, in our, in our redemptive refuge, what are we going to do? We're going to live. We're going to thrive. You're going to, you know, like have homes. You're going to um, plant gardens. You're going to have businesses, whatever it might be. The, the city of refuge in Nigeria, uh, 550 acres of land, two hospitals, uni two, two universities, high schools, primary schools, kindergartens, um, Bible schools, accommodation, houses like you wouldn't believe. Um, what else have they got? Fleet of buses. And they did have, they did have, well they still have it, but it's no longer their church building. A, an, an auditorium for 50,000 people. But they had five services a Sunday. That's 250,000 people every Sunday. So in 20, was it 20, 2007, in the year of the GFC, 
by cash, not from outside donations, from any Western church or anything. It was all Nigeria. It was all through Bishop Oyedepo. They built another auditorium, which, which took more than 50,000 items, whether 150,000 or something like this, massive thing, cost US $20 million and they paid cash for it. And they had another US $20 million in the bank ready to go to the second phase of the building. There is no limit with God. And that all came not from external donations, but it came from their faith in God. So, you know, there's, there's a whole different level of living that Jeremiah's talking about here, that Bishop Oyudepo has raised his people into, that we have to access for the sake of our own lives, for the sake of our own families, but for the sake of the nations. A redemptive refuge, a place where people can come, we can thrive. And I know we've got that stupid di digital bill passed. They can't even stop people from hacking what we've got. You know, there's all these things happening in our, um, in our government, but everything is subject to change. Yeah. You know, we continue to pray for a righteous government and for a just economic system. Yeah right, um, and recognise that the, the system of God, the judgement of God, the, uh, the grace of God is so much more powerful than any uh, earthly government. But he's saying, I want you to be able to thrive. I want you to take charge of your life. I want you to become self-sufficient, like God's God sufficient, but make a living, build family, build a strong community. And then he says in verse 7, and seek the peace and the well-being of the city to which I've caused you to be carried away captive. See, it was God's purpose. They had sinned, but it was his plan still. And he says, pray to the Lord for it, for in the well-being and the peace of the city in which you live, you will have peace and well-being. Yeah. So he's saying, I want you to contribute to the well-being of a greater community. Seek the peace and the prosperity of the city to which you've been called. We need to be seeking the peace and the prosperity of the Gold Coast. For as the Gold Coast is peaceful, and as the Gold Coast prospers, it will flow into its citizens. It's a responsibility to pray for the city in which we dwell. We want to see it turned. We've got a Christian mayor. We've got lots of churches that are working towards community and, and unity. But we've got a long way to go. So many people hurting, so many kids on drugs, so many homeless, so many unemployed. You know, the hospitals are full, the waiting lists are long. We've got to make a difference. But only Jesus, Yeshua can do that, right? Yeah. Only Yeshua can do that. And so in Jeremiah 29, 7, he says, I want you to release shalom into the city in which you are. Release shalom, the fullness of everything that's good of God. The shalom with the authority to destroy the chaos. Yes. Shalom. So every morning, if we just bless the Gold Coast with shalom, peace, it's all we need to do. But he says, I want you to pray for the peace and the prosperity of the city to which you are in. Because as it is peaceful and as it prospers, so will you be. Pray for the welfare of the city. And then he said, I want you to, it's almost like pursue. Um, pursue the manifestation of success and influence. And, and that's not like material success. But think about who came out of this 70-year exile. Daniel, Esther, Nehemiah. They all had great influence. They all change things. So he's saying, I want you to seek for God's highest and best for your life because the amount of influence that I want to release through you, the amount of influence that you carry, the significance of your life, I want to release it into the people around you because you can be a nation changer. Look at Daniel. How many kings did he go through? Three or four? Yes. Esther, you know, saved her whole people. Nehemiah. The walls had been down for years and he built them in 50-something days. What are you aiming for? What are you aiming for? I don't know what, quite what to aim for, right? Because just when I think, yeah, that's it, I don't know. <laughs> so we can pray things like, 
God, will you make me as great as you want me to be? Because he knows the level of our character. He knows how great what we can handle. So you make me as great as you want me to be. But God, I ask, maximize my influence, maximize my impact. I want you to um, let me fulfill the divine potential that you've placed within me. In, uh, oh my gosh, what's the name of that, that footy guy that's the, the coach? Yes, Bennett. I could think of the skinny little face. Wayne Bennett. He wrote a book called Don't Die With The Music In You. And in that, he said that he would put the, the football players that, go, that have to run around the oval so many times. Like, you know, I wouldn't even walk it. But they had to run around the oval so many times. But he said he looked out for the ones that slowed down when they came inside of the goalpost at the end. Because the ones that slowed down always kept something in reserve and never gave everything. So he looked for the ones that put on a sprint towards the end so they'd finish well. So we need to have the spirit of a finisher, that we wouldn't slow down. Oh, yeah, I'm almost there. I'm slowing down. But we'd push through and by the power of the Holy Ghost and we would take the ground. So, you know, we've got to realise that God is wanting to raise up people. And I'm not talking like, you know, there will be millionaires and, and stuff that God raises up because of what he wants to do through them. But I'm not talking about that. I am talking about the power of influence. I'm talking about the power of significance. I'm talking about the power that you have to speak into the ear of someone who can make a change. I'm talking about the fact that God wants to position you right where he wants you to be so that you will have maximum impact, so that you will fulfill divine potential, so that you won't die with the music still in you, but everything would have been expended for the glory of our God. And so he said, when you start to move into this redemptive refuge, as we start to think about it, think about what Jeremiah said to the people that were in Babylon. That is not the sort of letter I would be expecting. That's totally foreign to what you think would be given to people who have been taken captive into another country. But God is, is so different in the way he sees things. Yes. And so we have to start recognising that there are things that we have to change as the Holy Spirit leads. I'm not saying works or anything like that. I'm saying as the Holy Spirit leads you, as he shows you, as he guides you, as we surrender to him, as we say whatever you want, Lord, because we want to establish a redemptive refuge. And we want it in our lives, in our families. We want it in, in this house. We want it in the lives of our community around us as much as we can. We want to expand it. We want to enlarge it. We want it to be everything God wants it to be. Um, but it starts off with thinking differently. You might have been brought here as captives, but I want you to think like free people. I want you to take charge of your lives. I want you to know how to move around the society because, you know, and, and not in a way that draws attention to yourself, but you flow with it so that you can fulfill what God's called you to fulfill. So that Esther's, the Daniel's, the Nehemiah's can be raised up and can bring about change. You know, I've got such a, a cry for transformation on the inside of me, transformation of people, transformation of homes and families, transformation of communities and of nations and cities. We need to see the transformation because the kingdom is about transformation. The church is about coming together. And, and the, But when we leave here, we go out into a mission field. When we leave here, we go out to people who need to know about Yeshua. When we leave here, we go out to people who might only have a few days left to live and we've got to be able to release the power and demonstration of the kingdom of God so that they can see there's something so much greater than what they're suffering and what they're going through to be able to bring peace to families you know with kids on drugs or they're just parents and kids aren't talking to each other oh my gosh we know we, we are agents of reconciliation ministers of reconciliation and so we leave here and we go out there and we take on that ministry of reconciliation we take on that ministry of change we take it on and led and guided by the Holy Spirit, you leave eternal deposits in the hearts and lives of people. You leave eternal deposits and, and eternal suggestions and divine solutions in situations and circumstances. Just by walking into a meeting, you can change the atmosphere and change the agenda to something that the devil wants, to something that God has ordained. You are so powerful. You are incredibly powerful. You have the fullness of the anointing of, of Yeshua on you. You've got the fullness of the Holy Ghost. You've got the power 
power of God. You've got the anointing, the glory, the word of God. You've got the name. You've got everything, you know, and we, we, it's not a time to shrink back. It's not a time to live small. It is a time to rise up and go, you know what, even if nobody goes with me, I'm going to fulfill what God's called me to fulfill. Even if it's all by myself, I'm doing it. For the sake of his glory, for the sake of the fruitfulness that we want to bring back to him when we, we go home. So for the sake of glory and fruitfulness, for the sake of the good of people and to plunder hell. I want to plunder hell. I want to save people from hell. And I know there's a teaching going around at the moment that nobody goes to hell. But that's not what I see when I read the Bible. You are called You are called. All of you are called. All of you are ordained and commissioned. You are ministers of reconciliation. Yes. You are the ones that he has called to do the work of the ministry. Fivefold ministry is just to say this is how you do it and then out you go and do it. But you have to take control of your life and live the way he tells you to live. Otherwise, if you are not controlling your life, who is? Finances, is money controlling your life? Other relatives, other people in your life, are they telling you how to live? Who's telling you how to live your life if you are not taking control under the lordship of Jesus Christ? It has to be under his lordship. But it's time. It's time. So we must all kind of like get the idea, the, ask God for a revelation of what a redemptive refuge would look like in our lives. What would it look like? Mm, come on out. I'll just, just I'll step on that word refuge. So that people on Zoom. Okay. Um, I was really sitting with the word refuge. Um, I need my glasses for this actually. And I went to the 1828 Webster's Dictionary. The reason why I go to the 1828 version is because it's the original f dictionary based on scripture. So modern dictionaries will change over time, whereas the Webster's Dictionary has the original language. Um, and that one says, one of the definitions is that which shelters or protects from danger, distress, or calamity a stronghold which protects by its strength, or a sanctuary which secures safety by its sacredness. Yes, that one. Yes. You'll have that one. Yes. yes. Just repeat that again. Oh, yeah. Stronghold. Okay. That which shelters or protects from danger, distress or calamity, a stronghold which protects by its strength, or a sanctuary which secures safety by its sacredness. Yeah, mm -hmm. that one, we'll take the last one. A sanctuary of sacredness and safety. So we need to, so even as we go, we're learning that God is wanting to re, Sa yeah, sanctuary of sacredness, isn't that beautiful? Uh, he's wanting to, to rephrase our language. And so, Father, we thank you. We, we, we just love that phrase, the sanctuary of sacredness and then safety for the people. Thank you, Father. So, Lord, I pray that you would show us as individuals and as families how to make our homes and our lives a sanctuary of sacredness. And how can Open Heaven Ministries, how can this house be a sanctuary of sacredness? We thank you, Lord, for what you're revealing to us. We thank you for what you're showing us. And we thank you for what you're doing in our lives. Sanctuary of sacredness. 
And as you are temples of the Holy Spirit, you are walking sanctuaries of sacredness. 